hey everyone, it's Dr. Tamara Beckford with Your Karen Docs. That's right, where we bring you health and wellness info so that you can take part of it and you can take control of your life, right? But we have a super awesome segment, Your Karen Docs, Docs Who Cares, where we bring doctors from all over the world. They're going to drop gems on health and wellness. Biggest part is they're going to leave their info here so you can find them if you would like to be a client of theirs or if you'd like to be a patient of theirs, right? But today, I got a super awesome gem. I am so amped. If you guys cannot tell already by the energy that's flowing through the screen and through your speakers, right? So I'm going to be bringing on, introducing, I'm going to first, I'm going to give you a little background of them. I'll bring her on. I'm so amped. So we have here a doctor who, boom, she went to Baylor College of Medicine when she did her residency at Baylor College of Medicine in psychiatry, right? She is the founder of the Dr. Alana Trauma Recovery Institute, which is dedicated to eradicating psychological trauma worldwide by providing public education and professional training in empathy skills that is practical and it'll help for, for traumatic um, humans, right? She has the skills over pills, I totally love that. Skills over pills approach to self-healing and trauma recovery. I'm telling y'all, introducing to the mic, <laughs> America's only, only trauma psychiatrist. You guys help me welcome Dr. Alana Curry, aka Dr. Alana. Woo! <laughs> If you guys cannot tell, I am amped. I am so amped. Like when I started the Your Karen Docs, Docs Who Cares, she's one of the top people that I like sent out like immediately like, hey, I need you on, I need you on, I need you on. So I harassed her so much. She was like, I, right, you know what? I'm coming on. And I love, love, love. And I'm so happy that she decided to stop by. Dr. Alana, come on. Thank you so much, sis. I appreciate it. I'm excited to be here. Thank you for just not, you know, just, just staying on me so we could sync our schedules together. I'm so happy to be here. I am super, super amped to because I know that you are such a blessing to so many. And there's some, you know, who know, and but I want everybody to know yeah. about you because you are, like we said, America's only only trauma um, psychiatrist only. it didn't it didn't exist until i created it unfortunately yeah. um and that is really a sad state of affairs to me um that we have not thought of trauma as a central component of mental health it's kind of been on the outskirts it's sort of a subdivision of categories that we explore sometimes, you know, but we are becoming over the last 10 years, there's just been a, or really a little longer is an explosive uptake of understanding how trauma affects the brain and that therefore affects the programming of the person in very real time. So to me, that was a huge indication that if we don't recognize trauma as a core mental health condition that everyone experiences, mm -hmm. um, we are missing a huge part of what can be helpful to people um, in real time with their healing. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, I'm actually going to be talking to another colleague, too, who's even talking about like the trauma that expresses in kids and how it can also even go on further to cause other issues later on. So you guys stay tuned for that. But with Dr. Alana, I want to know what made you decide to um, go into um, trauma, into, you know, being the first and yeah. only <laughs> trauma psychiatrist. What are what are what is it behind that made you decide it? What's the story behind? That? I think I was drawn to trauma because as a condition, it's considered treatable. And I saw that. I saw people who had PTSD and borderline personality disorder and all these other conditions that we considered manifestations of trauma um, learn how to use their traumas to heal themselves in a way and still have really productive lives. Mm -hmm. And that resonated for me also because um, my 
my father is a Vietnam veteran. I have family members who are Afghan and Afghanistan and uh, Iraq war veterans. So I personally didn't really identify myself as having experienced trauma either. I was sort of treating it as the bread and butter way that we treat trauma mm -hmm. until 2014 when Michael Brown Jr. was killed. Mm -hmm. And that was a big um, wake up call for me to to really say, like, wait, why? Why have we not figured out this racism thing? Why haven't we figured out this um, huge divide that we experience things across? And it started to occur to me that these uh, we have primitive brain systems that affect the way we interpret each other. Mm. And your traumatic experiences program how you interpret what's going on in your environment, in your world. And the words that we use and the labels that we use directly feed back to create invisible sensations inside of us, mm -hmm. otherwise known as feelings and right. emotions and responses that then come out of our mouth, come out of our body, come out of our action choices. And we think that it's the other person or God or the devil that is, causing us to behave that way mm -hmm. and what it really is is these internal juices and right. biology that we have not been taught to appreciate mm -hmm. within ourselves and so when I started doing some self-study and was like now wait a minute that bless it like I when I'm looking back at my life mm -hmm. and my past uh uh, damn near ju juvenile delinquent behaviors um, <laughs> when, <laughs> when I was a kid, you know, and other things like I didn't know that I was experiencing trauma mm. from my environment and the way that I had been raised and the things that my family had gone through and the experience of being a black kid in St. Louis in, in, you know, the middle of white flight and all the racism and things that we experienced there. Mm -hmm. So, when I stepped back and was like, okay, so I'm hearing trauma patterns from my patients, but my colleagues and my friends and my family and ooh, even me, mm, right? Self-discovery. Oh, are speaking and thinking with these same trauma patterns. Mm -hmm. Okay, there's something fishy here. We're missing something in our current way of looking at the world. And that made me step back and begin to study like, OK, I can I see this uh, amygdala causing these emotions and make me want to go this way, mm -hmm. you know, off the road, <laughs> cut somebody out, you know, or whatever it is that you do when you feel triggered mm -hmm. versus being able to and get calm myself down enough to use my prefrontal cortex to engage this part of the brain. Mm -hmm. And then I said, okay, well, if humans are running on, you only using 10 to 15% of this best part of our brain, mm -hmm. what if we focused on programming that would help us activate that? Wow. Get, get our minds past all of this very loud primitive input, but be able to dissect it in a way that it can be useful in the moment to create a different outcome. So that's why I picked these little acronyms. This is the done skill. Done. Love it. Yes. Descriptive, objective, non judgmental, and effective. I love it. The done skill. The done skill. Wow. It's so, done with trauma thinking. <laughs> done with the trauma thinking. We're, we're, you know, we're moving beyond it. We're done with that. So, you know, we're talking about like, the traumatic experience and how it affects and how you as a trauma psychiatrist, the only trauma psychiatrist, come together with um, ways to help, um, you know, people to overcome and to be done with the mm -hmm. traumatic um, experience and the actions secondary to that. Now, one of the things we talked about prior um, to even jumping on, and I think that this is a good um, analogy. So we talked about um, right now within the last two weeks, um, this recording is in August um, of 2021. 
um, there was an athlete um, that had been um, out in the news. So her name is Shakari Richardson. So just for clarification, Dr. Alana does not treat Shakari Richardson. Mm-hmm. We are not a I don't treat anybody. <laughs> I'm retired. Hey, Absolutely. I just but she has the skills that she's going to impart. So just for those of you who might not know um, about this, this is a track and field athlete. And um, prior to the Olympic trials, I think it was approximately maybe two weeks prior to that, she lost her mom, right? Then due to um, having marijuana in her system, although she made it to the Olympics and the trials, she lost the opportunity to run in the Olympics because she had the marijuana in her system. And that was a violation. Um, Then after the Olympics, there was this um, first big race that occurred. And then she lost that race also. Now we're asking, or I'm asking this question because it shows that there's been a series of trauma, I would Mm -hmm. think, which is loss within a short period of time for someone who would deal with something like this. How would, how is your done theory? How does it work to help patients like that? Sure. Yeah. Well, I think that you have done a good job of laying out some of her more recent, probably traumatic experiences, but less defined trauma, first of all, for people. Yeah. Um, because most people think about trauma as something has to physically hit your body. Mm-hmm. And you I'm to... in, so, you know, I'm emergency yeah. medicine. So, you yeah. know, we, we deal with the physical part, but I right. don't you know. We're yeah. about to it down well, we body. act as if something can happen to your, something traumatic can happen to your physical body without your psyche experiencing it too, which is weird. But anyway, uh, <laughs> because if you break your arm in a car accident, your psychology, your brain went through that painful, (laughs) scary experience also. But anywho, um, trauma is actually any experience that you have that is experienced internally negative enough that it changes the way you think about yourself, Mm -hmm. other people, and the rest of the world. And so from that standpoint, lots of things can traumatic. So we're talking about um, her birth mother dying and you know, missing the Olympics because of the marijuana in her system. But we can't even go back to her life story of being um, a young lady who was smaller than other people. She also had family drama because she wasn't actually raised by her birth mom. We know that poverty is a um, adverse childhood um, uh, event that causes trauma. Mm -hmm. And I believe she's also a member of the LGBTQ community. So she experiences invalidation there. And so when people are used to fighting and because they have to fight the world for their just to be recognized, to be heard. And sometimes, especially a small person, she makes herself bigger with hair and nails and all the things, you know, I love her flavor and I love how she's had to amp herself up and amp herself on to greatness with lots of people telling her probably along the way that she couldn't do it and she does. Mm -hmm. So there is a level of protection that's in her responses of of the way that she's been taught to respond to adversity. But that pattern also can lead to fighting when there's nothing to fight, you know, be, be, you know, popping off when it would be better to be silent and learn and grow and work on yourself So that, you know, I agree with her that she's young, she'll be back, she's going to do great things. Mm -hmm. But there's also a time where you have to get quiet and be able to process the emotions and the things that's going on and let yourself cry, let yourself heal, Mm -hmm. let yourself, you know, life finds its ways to humble you in a good way because you can still be dope and be humble, you know. Mm -hmm. And and that is, um, I think she'll find that balance. But sometimes when you are just on fuel of getting things done, you you are not really being mindful or thoughtful in your responses. You're just still mm-hmm. fighting. So, you know, I pray her peace, um, but it takes work and like a lot of self-work to give yourself space to feel. And I, I think a lot of the athletes are saying being an elite athlete is a lot of pressure and fame. It just adds to it. There's a lot of people who think that being a celebrity 
It's so hunky dory because they have money, but they deal with a lot of really painful, damaging things. And they have to do it in the public eye with a bunch of people who, you know, get online and become Ooh, Twitter warriors. Keyboard warriors. <laughs> <laughs> right. So then, you know, if you're already struggling with where you are mentally and then you have other people piling it on you um, and giving their um, funky opinions about it, mm -hmm. then it's really hard to heal and to be able to have that time and space so I would say to her you know take a break and do some mental health work but I would say that to any and everybody I well, think that's the that, reason why I asked this so this yeah. is even though and you know I put a name to this athlete and the person who's going through this but the reason why I asked this is because I as you mentioned I said that you know loss 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 of this loss of that and there's so many people who are going through so many losses right yeah. so there are many people who are aren't in the public eye and they're going through the losses but they might be doing it in maybe their version of the public eye in front of their families their friends their social circle you know when it's like oh man look again oh there's another loss which they might interpret as failure and you know so that's why I, we're, we're trying to help the those at large to understand like if you're going through all of these these are some of the ways that you can help to cope with it right so we're saying like take a time get some mental help and you're gonna come back full force right you can do it you can absolutely do it now you know one of the other things that we're talking about we just talked about a specific situation where we had someone who's going through a specific loss but then we're talking about trauma overall and if there's anything that we know we are in the time with a huge amount of trauma aka the pandemic everyone multiple pandemics it yes. will be if Absolutely. we're being factual, we're in the middle of multiple at the pandemics. same time. Yeah. So, what are some of the um, the different ways that you're seeing that this these multiple pandemics are impacting people? And um, and then with that, I want you to also give us how your particular because you do have this wonderful program that you have out there. How you use this program to help those who are going through this. Sure. So I think that it's important for us to acknowledge that the pandemic is traumatic. Um, and there's a lot of people who will say, well, you know, I'm doing better during the pandemic than I was before. And, and I, I understand I feel better because I've had the opportunity to do some self-work, some pivoting, some reorienting. Um, but there are definitely people who feel worse. And we've had uh, major increases in people um, expressing their feeling a lot of sadness, anger, anxiety, depression. We're having, um, we have a, a, a horrible situation in Afghanistan. We have climate change. We have gun violence. We have racism. We have uh, just ish going on Everything. all over the globe. Yes. So we can safely say that every single person is, has, and will experience things that are psychologically traumatic. Just keep, as my grandmama say, just keep on living, baby. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> right? Um, However, mm -hmm. we can get rid of the stigma, right, of trauma when you understand that it's something that everybody has and everyone goes through. Mm -hmm. And that most people think that they're kind of crazy because of what's going on in their mind right now. And it's like, yeah, no, this is actually the expected result biologically of being impacted by trauma. And there's actually a very predictable system of response. You only need to know seven parts of your brain to really understand trauma. Hmm. Six of them primitive, one the prefrontal cortex that rules them all. That's what I tell people. So you, yeah. those, those six primitive brain systems are your reticular activating system, which is like a filter that pulls your mind towards things that are important to you and filters other things out in the background. Hmm. Well, when you experience trauma, those things get programmed so that your brain's trying to get ahead of it and your mind will catch things that may indicate that trauma could happen again. Mm -hmm. But that means that you have a skew 
a filter on your mind that takes you to the dark side more easily unless you're aware and are tuning it into the positive things because those exist too, right? Love it. <laughs> In the same way, we talked about that amygdala that generates your emotions, not based on factual, objective reality, based on what you are interpreting is happening at any given moment. It will create the proportional response inside of you. I again for those in the back. <laughs> your amygdala is what creates your emotions, not him or her. He don't make you feel good. She doesn't make you mad. It's your amygdala doing that for you based on what you are telling yourself about the situation. Mm. Well, that is so um, deep. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you know what? It, I, what I'll say about it is that we are taught to ignore emotions or that we're not supposed to have them or that having them is weak. And I say it's impossible to not have them. Absolutely. And your amygdala's input is not even subtle, honestly. You just don't know to attribute it to your amygdala. You, right. But where our amygdala is constantly functioning, sometimes it's louder than other times. But if you're not feeling emotions, that means you're calm or peaceful or happy or numb. But it doesn't mean that you're not happy them. And there's no such thing as being a human and not happy them. So that whole I ain't never scared, you know, all that that we like to say, you know. Not true. Yeah, you know, like no fear. We're so uh, uh, like that's biologically impossible, but okay, right? <laughs> Okay, number three, your somatosensory cortex is the part of your brain that registers pain. It treats physical pain like a pinch, mm -hmm. the same as psychological pain. So you can slap somebody psychologically, mm. and, and it happens often, yeah. <laughs> daily. Absolutely. <laughs> and, and sometimes people are slapping themselves by what they tell themselves about themselves and other people, too. Mm. Yeah. because the way that we think so it can it can be pain signals all the way from a pinch ouch you know oh you, you look in the mirror you so ugly today ouch right yes, yes. Mm -hmm. but that that is how we cre recreate these trauma cycles even when maybe no one else is there our mind continues to recreate these experiences for us over and over again until we unlearn those thought habits um, number four, your brain reward system, your addiction system. Mm -hmm. Everybody has one. It's constantly functioning. Every time we, we're on computers that are giving us dopamine stimulation through the screen, we, um, we log into smartphones that we, the blings and the dings and social media that gives us dopamine. Um, we, uh, anytime you see a commercial or an ad and all of a sudden you find yourself purchasing that thing and a box shows up on your doorstep and you can't figure out how that keeps happening. Just show up. <laughs> dopamine, dopamine, sex, dopamine, relationships, dopamine, even your kids and your friends and your family, they are addictions. Mm -hmm. and we have addictions that can be healthy for us. And then we have addictions that can be unhealthy. We are far more familiar with our unhealthy coping mechanisms mm -hmm. than our healthy ones. And so many of us are being driven by the dopamine system without the awareness of its impact because we think that addiction is something for them people over there. Like you got to be laid out in the corner. <laughs> being brought in, but there's so many other forms. Yes, because there you can be addicted to politics. You can be addicted to um, political news and conspiracies and paranoia and that and fear lots of addictions to fear because mm -hmm. it does give a dopamine response to feeling like you're right about something and then we just burrow further into a semi-delusional hole right. of our own opinion see, i told you that's what you tell them i see i was right and then you just continue along wow mm -hmm. Yeah. So number five is the mirror neuron system. Mirror neurons are 
part of how we upload information from our environment. So it's the same system where, um, like when I was in New Orleans for college, sometimes I find myself being like, hey, oh, oh come here, baby. And I'm like, wait, dang, I done picked up this accent. You yeah. know, so <laughs> if somebody is saying a so- uh, singing a song and then you're singing a song too, you're like, dang, it got stuck in my head. Absolutely. Our brains are very good at picking up the words that we use, the labels, especially from role players in our environment, whether it's parents or a big brother or a neighbor across the street. But the people we look up to, the celebrities that we like, they shape the way that we think about the world and the words that we use for things. So if I learn to look in the mirror and use certain words for myself, Mm -hmm. nappy head, right? My hair is curly. I love my hair, by the way. But if if you grow up and your environment says that it's nappy and that it's not something good, when you look in the mirror, you will apply that label. What's your amygdala going to do? That's a that's a automatic, a negative emotion. Your somatosensory cortex got slapped by your own thought process. Right. Mm -hmm. But those mirror neurons shape the way that we interact with our environment. So we have to understand that sometimes we're mirroring unhealthy thought processes that we can fix. And then last but not least, um, your biochemical matrix, which is my jump term for adrenaline, testosterone, cortisol, all of the the chemicals that come flooding through your body (laughs) that, 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 you know, hype you up. You know, people with panic attacks probably would be familiar with this Mm. sensation of just a huge amount of like somebody shook you up like a Coke can and it's all bottled up. And those those uh, chemicals have to do with extending and expanding the emotions that we feel quite often. So understanding your biology is huge because we are not taught about these um, direct connections from our brain to how we feel and the choices that we make in our mental health and how much of the of ability we have to control what comes next. Our, instead of our emotions controlling us, Absolutely. we can learn how to control how our emotions affect what we do. Wow, this is so fascinating. I know a lot of people are gonna be, love, love, love this episode. Me included, I'm here in awe, in awe of all of this. So I cannot imagine those who are listening or those who are gonna be watching this. I mean, you just really just broke down the different components of the brain and as to why we think and react the way that we do. And not only that, in, like we said, knowledge is power, right? In understanding why we do react that way, once you start to notice a pattern, well, you know, okay, there goes that amygdala is ready to blow this out of control. Whoop, I Mm -hmm. can't shut you down. down. Don't, don't, there you go, amygdala. We are not going to let you take control. You're not, you're not holding the mic right now. Right. So we're absolutely able to do all of that. And then, you know, that, like we said, we usually think about like our addictions in in the negative sense, but there's some other types of addictions that are out there. Right. So it's not just drugs, it's not just alcohol. And, you know, once you can pinpoint and then even the dopamine response, right. You can Mm -hmm. pinpoint, well, wow, this is, I can see that this is causing X in me that yeah. can now control additional portions. That's yeah. why I see that. I know good and well when I'm walking to that pantry for the for those chips that I, that what's what's happening. <laughs> like my dopamine. The pandemic. There are many many different ways the pandemic is affecting us all. Those yeah. of us we're getting our steps in going to the pantry. So. <laughs> And but I love this approach, which I can see, which is like when you're saying you're teaching the skills over pills, like, you know, how even just understanding your body can help you to take a little bit of control. Wow. So and I tell, but let me qualify also, because when I say skills over pills, I don't mean that there will never that stop taking your medicines oh, and no, no, no. medicines don't work. So I want to make sure I clarify Absolutely. what I mean by skills over pills is that you just can't take a medication for every time where you would probably be feeling uh, emotionally triggered or overwhelmed or panicky that would probably eventually become unhealthy. And there's a lot of these medications that are addictive. 
Mm-hmm. So my from my perspective is that we don't do enough teaching ourselves how to wrestle our own animal because this mm-hmm. is an animal. This biology affects our psychology and then our psychology creates for us in real time uh, emotions and urges and surges that then have to be wrestled into submission to get yourself where you want to be because if you slap a, oh, oh i'm sorry you, you know. can't do all of that now. <laughs> you gotta you gotta you there goes that amygdala. there, that. there <laughs> you go there so, goes that amygdala oh there it is there it is and there is a little bitty little booger it's a little bean shape little bean shape little almond shape with a tail that swoops up but this part right here, this prefrontal cortex, mm-hmm. that is the part right behind the forehead. And I have people tap it to wake it up. The, like uh, back in the Nintendo game, you used to have to reset it. Yeah. <laughs> reset, right? Because those other brain systems, those six that I described for you, for you, mm-hmm. you can imagine how much of our perspective is driven by those primitive impulses when you put all those things together. It's, it's a lot. So once you recognize that, that's where the done skill comes in. Because when you're doing descriptive, objective, non-judgmental, and effective thinking, that is being produced by your prefrontal cortex, your CEO, your higher wisdom. I call it your God mind. That's where you can access a perspective that's outside of your little pinpoint bubble of perception, like what you think you know, is being strongly influenced by all of this that's happening inside of you. But when you're like, if I'm looking in the mirror and I say, you know, Ugh, so, so ugly, just nappy headed, you know, that is going to set off all of that primitive biology. But I can recognize and say, OK, descriptively, OK, my hair might need to be cut and shaped and there's, you know, there's something that I may be able to do to make that more presentable. But that is a descriptive, objective, and less a, a judgmental way of thinking about your your hair. So that I even get on my my young ones and I, it's a bad hair day. I'm like, no, it may be a day where your hair is not doing what you would like it to do, but you're never ugly. But people treat their feelings as if they are fat. Mm-hmm. And when you treat your feelings like they're fact, a lot of times what you're telling yourself is not only deceiving you, but it's causing damage to what you may do next and making you not see the the, the awesomeness and amazingness of yourself. Like I said, all of us are like supernatural creatures just out here just doing amazing, amazing stuff. Yeah, but you use these negative terms and and so when you recognize it then you can use your done descriptive and you're right you know just even using the descriptor like oh well my hair might not be the way i want it to be today oh well you know today this shirt might not be the shirt that i want to wear to this particular event yeah. not the, oh i'm so this i'm so you know instead of using it and and taking it to a personal level you really once mm-hmm. you describe it you take it away and you I can see how it's the CEO which is the prefrontal cortex helps you to pull it away so now you're not so emotionally tied to those things and then you're using it as yourself it's really a shirt it's really a hair you yeah. know it's not you <laughs> yes yes right? it, it is like? a component that, um, and and when you break things into digestible language like that Mm -hmm. it might take it from something that a thought that's so extreme that it may cause so much pain that you want to die or that you want to lash out and hurt someone else or kill someone else you can turn the thoughts into um like maybe instead of a 10 out of 10 mad now you're like six out of 10 i'm still upset but i now i can control what i do because i can see the bigger picture versus just responding in how I'm feeling in the moment might get me put in jail. Right. Probably gonna get me fired. Yeah. Might get me broke up with. <laughs> may, may, you know, all these things that we actually have control over, but because we're built outward facing, mm-hmm. we're so good at seeing what everybody else is doing. And I'm like, mm-hmm. when all that was going on, what were you doing? What were you saying? What are you thinking? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Wow. This is fascinating. Fascinating. All righty. 
Woo. Okay. Dr. Alana. I mean, you got to let us know because all these folks, I'm pretty sure <laughs> they want to know where can they find you. Where can they find you? Where can they find you? And, you know, tell us uh, about your program. Like, just drop, drop, drop. Let yeah. them know. Absolutely. So they can find me on social media. Facebook is my primary platform, but I'm on Instagram, YouTube, and Twitter. Um, The way to learn from me is to sign up for the Trauma Recovery Academy at TraumaRecoveryAcademy.com. That is the only way to access what I offer. And the way that I do that is providing digital educational content. I make it fun. I make it Um, interesting, but you can access that 24-7, watch the videos and take take in the information in a self-paced way. And then once a month, you're eligible to participate in our monthly virtual skills coaching group where you bring real life scenarios to the table and we talk about how do we apply the skills that we're teaching and the biological education that you've received. We, uh, we meet on the third Thursdays of the month. So that's the way to pe- where people can come get with me, Trauma Recovery Academy. It's $97 a month for access to the membership program, which is the best package deal, although you can purchase the courses one, um, um, one at a time. Wonderful, wonderful. I'm telling you, this is so awesome. So when you're out there not taking care of everyone else, how does Dr. Alana take care of herself? Ooh. Dancing. Okay. I'm glad you asked. <laughs> I think I take care of myself most by like refusing to take care of everybody else. Like I, I think that's the power of no. The power of boundaries, the power of saying no, this is I I can't listen to every the stories of every person that I know might need. Um, what I teach because there's so many traumatized people. I, I lovingly and jokingly and horrifyingly say that there are 7 billion creators walking the earth traumatized on primitive mode, getting primitive results. And I, what I do understand this applies to any human being. Mm-hmm. And so the best way that I can serve is to put quality content within a place that they can access it at any time and to say no. Uh, (laughs) Like, no, I can't answer everybody's calls. I can't hear everyone's stories because I've heard thousands um, and I'm very grateful to the veterans that I talk to who are some of the most traumatized people on the face of the earth. Um, And it still boils down to those seven brain systems. So get you some. (laughs) Hey, hey, get that CEO and Get that CEO back in charge. Yeah. It's, on, it's on you. It's on you, friends. <laughs> love it, love it, love it. Dr. Alana, I am so honored to be on this platform with you. You have dropped so many gems. I mean, I would be sitting and listening to this pre-recording again. I love it. And I'm going to absolutely be sharing it. Other than the fact that, um, you know, Dr. Lana, so you can find her at traumarecovery.com, right? Where she is dropped all of her gems and it's there for you to be able to take control of your life. You notice that's how she's able to have you take control by breaking down the whole system and so that you bring that tap, tap, tap CEO back in charge. Now, I loved this interview so much. She's absolutely going to be available on our Your Karen Docs website. That's www.urcaringdocs. Yes, and you can find this interview will also be available on our YouTube channel, right? It's still YouTube slash Your Karen Docs. So, for all of you, you're going to find us. This podcast is available on our Apple. Apple Podcasts is available anywhere that you do listen to podcasts on Spotify, Buzzsprout, and all the additional um, podcast station. We're going to thank Dr. Alana for dropping the gems. Yes, today we had ooh, the ooh, U.S. Ooh, only trauma psychiatrist that just dropped all of these gems. Boom. Now you know all the seven parts of your brain. We need you all to tap, 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 get that CEO in charge when that boom other portions, especially that amygdala, that little tap part, wants Baby. to take over. Let's keep CEO in charge. I'm Dr. Tamara Beckwith with Your Care and Docs. Thank you so much, Dr. Alana. Boom, boom, boom for dropping all this knowledge. We will see you guys next time. <laughs>